Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak today and for all of your time. I know it's getting to the end of the program, so uh, bear with me. Uh, Accusella is a Seattle-based company. We specialize in uh, developing technologies around blinding ocular diseases. Uh, we're a bit technology agnostic, and I'll speak more about this in a little bit. Uh, so our pipeline consists of a number of small molecules. Uh, as that is also our core capability, but also a device. And I'm here today to specifically talk to you about our gene therapy program and how Accucella aims to bring vision back to patients blinded by retinitis pigmentosa. We're a publicly traded company, so you read all that in two seconds. Uh, and to understand our gene therapy, you need to understand a little bit about how Accucella selects programs for our pipeline. <clears throat> We don't have a single technology platform that we try to apply to a variety of indications. We actually start with the disease, the unmet medical need, and really the market opportunity, and then work to identify a technology with a strong scientific rationale and with, um, excuse me, a strong scientific rationale and that we can also develop very efficiently from a cost and time standpoint. In this case, we've applied that framework to retinitis pigmentosa. Many of you probably know it. It's an inherited retinal degeneration uh, that causes photoreceptor cell death. It's a very complex disease with over 100 different genes indicated in the pathology. That's very important for why we selected the technology that we did. It affects one in 4,000 people worldwide, and if SPARC gets approved, which I'm sure it will, there's very limited treatment available uh, for this indication. Uh, onset is usually in young people uh, with complete blindness occurring around the age of 40. It starts with uh, the loss of peripheral vision leading to complete blindness uh, through tunnel vision. So when we looked at this indication, we really thought there are two ways that you can approach the treatment. The first way and the more common approach is to slow down the cell death usually treat earlier in the disease state. But the problem with this is that because the disease is so slow progressing, you need a lot of patients, long time points in your development program for statistical significance. So your development program is quite inefficient. We thought that if we could restore vision with the right technology and could produce a clinical benefit in a short amount of time, that we'd be able to produce a much more efficient development program with uh, small patient numbers, uh, short time points, and a relatively low cost uh, compared to competitive approaches. So this is the, this is the idea that we have uh, went forward with and identified the field of optogenetics as a good opportunity. Optogenetics, both in and outside of ophthalmology, is the science of making non-light sensitive cells light sensitive through genetic modification. And you do this by expressing a class of proteins called opsins in your target cell. Opsins have been shown to restore vision in uh, rodent models of uh, retinal degeneration when expressed in non-light sensitive cells since about 2007. And there's a variety of different optogenetic per or opsins that you can express to do this. In RP, a very important aspect is that the photoreceptors die, but the rest of the retina, shown in levels two and three in the enlargement over the on the left, remain intact and largely functional and amenable to a therapy such, of, such as this. Vision can be restored by opsin expression in either level two, the bipolar cells, or in level three, the ganglion cells. We decided to target the on bipolar cells because they're closest to the photoreceptors. And by doing so, hopefully retain a large amount of the uh, innate uh, signal processing that the retina uses to process uh, visual uh, signals from the photoreceptors normally. So next, we needed to select our transgene, which opsin we wanted to express in those cells. And the slide now acts a little bit like a timeline too. Ophthalmic optogenetics was derived from non-ophthalmic applications using microbial ion channels. Next, synthetic opsins that tried to address some of the limitations of those initial microbial opsins were developed. And most recently, in about 2015, human opsins were, uh, began to be evaluated uh, for these optogenetic uh, approaches. We decided to go with the endogenous retinal protein normally expressed in the rod photoreceptors, human rhodopsin, for three reasons. The first and foremost is that it's a G-protein coupled receptor, whereas these other uh, technologies are largely ion channels. This means that we have much uh, higher light sensitivity than any of the uh, other technologies available the, uh, due to the G-protein uh, signal cascade amplification. Uh, 
with the human rhodopsin, uh, electrophysiological assays have demonstrated that you can get a visual response at a cellular level at uh, ambient light levels, whereas an ion channel requires uh, light intensities that are orders of magnitude above what anyone would experience on a, a normal day, somewhere in between um, indoor lighting and staring directly at the sun. Secondly, uh, and what synthetic opsins tried to, uh, or actually do, based on GenSight's most recent presentation, do address is the uh, potential toxicities of light itself. Microbial opsins respond to blue wavelength light, and when amplified to the intensity levels required for opsin activation, uh, could be potentially very detrimental to an already uh, fragile retina. Human rhodopsin responds to green wavelength of light, something in the middle of the spectrum, and we think will limit the uh, potential toxicities uh, therein. Thirdly, as an endogenous, endogenous human retinal protein, there's also a much lower immune risk uh, for expressing human rhodopsin in another retinal cell versus expressing a, a foreign protein. As a delivery vehicle, we've selected AAV. Uh, AAV, as I'm sure you all know, is fairly well characterized in the eye. And while the eye is described often as an organ very amenable to gene therapy due to uh, immune privilege, it's, its isolation from the rest of the body's systems, it definitely has its own unique uh, barriers. And so we've elected to engineer uh, and select our own AAV variant, uh, which will have an enhanced uh, transduction efficiency for our target cell, as well as lower the uh, risk of an immune response to the capsid. Also with the promoter, uh, we've decided to engineer a synthetic promoter, uh, which will specifically target transgene expression to the on bipolar cells. Uh, this is, has two advantages. First and foremost, we th believe that uh, specific expression to the target cell will clarify the signal. If you express your opsin in a variety of different retinal cell types, it could become muddled, and the brain might not be able to process the signal quite as well. Also, we think that by specifically targeting our uh, transgene, we'll limit the biodistribution and safety risks uh, that might arise from ubiquitous expression. So in summary, that's our solution. By expressing human rhodopsin packaged into an engineered AAV, with an uh, efficient and specific promoter, we make on bipolar cells light sensitive in the absence of photoreceptors. And by doing so, we offer a vision restoration therapy that will provide the best benefit to these patients. So as a predominantly small molecule company, you might wonder how exactly we're going to achieve this. And we've done so by creating a virtual partner network of experts in each of these fields. This allowed us to gain access to a level of experience and expertise that we wouldn't have normally been able to acquire. We've partnered with the University of Manchester uh, around for the uh, human rhodopsin technology with scientists who have pioneered the approach. We've we have an upcoming collaboration, which we'll be able to announce shortly, around the AAV, and have partnered with a company called Circularis in the Bay Area for the, promo for the promoter. We've also begun uh, talks with manufacturers, as well as people for preclinical development, and I'm here today to expand that network into uh, financial partnerships, and I'm open to discussing structures and uh, financial requirements to anybody who is interested. Now, a little bit about the data from Animal Proof of Concept. This is out of the University of Manchester. Uh, there's quite a large body of work where we've looked at um, electrophysiology, both ex vivo and in vivo, uh, and also, I think most importantly, the behavioral responses elicited in a uh, blind RD1 knockout mouse uh, that mimics uh, the uh, disease pathology. There's a number of different uh, approaches to optokinetic tracking. This is a more fun example uh, to, to lighten it up a bit, uh, where we showed a video of a swooping owl trying to recreate uh, some sort of predatorial response. Uh, and as you can see um, in the data on the right, the blind mouse uh, didn't respond with any change in locomotor behavior uh, when exposed to the visual stimulus whereas the wild type and uh, treated RD1 mice uh, who were treated with the human rhodopsin vector uh, showed a significant increase in uh, beha locomotor behavior uh, due to the video. In addition to the technological advances or advantages that I uh, described earlier, there's a few other advantages inherent to the program. Uh, first is that the visual signal pathway, uh, how the uh, 
signal is transferred from the photoreceptors to the, the bipolar cells, ganglion cells to the brain, is very highly conserved between mice and humans. So we believe that the uh, induced uh, mechanism will translate well into the clinic. Very importantly, and one of the uh, significant uh, uh, driving factors behind our selection of this technology is that it's disease mechanism and genotype independent. So we'll be able to theoretically address a large proportion of the late stage RP market, as well as move into uh, other indications uh, down the road. Lastly, we have applied our quick win, fast fail uh, methodology uh, and selected a, a technology that will be able to produce a functional clinical benefit in a relatively short amount of time in an indication where most, many approaches take years uh, to develop in the clinic. Speaking to that development plan, here's a quick look. Uh, we've built our partner network and we have uh, begun work to develop our targeted promoter and optimized AAV. We'll then move into manufacturing development are non-clinical and uh, aim to have human proof of concept in about four years. So thank you very much. And if anyone's interested, please feel free to contact me and I will speak to someone, anyone at the re reception later. So cheers.